Hello YouTube, this is Morgan Airspeed Prime here with my next Star Wars The Clone Wars uh, discussion video. This one is going to be all about Season 5, the last, I suppose, normal season of The Clone Wars that we had before the show got cancelled. Um, so, this is a very interesting one in that... You really have to go back to like what was kind of happening at the time like you know this is in or around when like Disney had first bought Lucasfilm bought the Star Wars franchise and yeah it's just this weird thing where like yeah one of the first things that they did was to cancel the Clone Wars and if not for the sort of save the Clone Wars campaign we wouldn't have got season six um, because like those were episodes deep into production and Disney after the backlash of the cancellation, let them finish those episodes. But it was because of that why so much of the other sort of important episodes got turned into comics and books. And it's so kind of ironic in so many ways to see what's happening now. Like, we're building up to, like, towards the end of this month, Season 7 of The Clone Wars finally being released, and it being one of the few sort of positive projects out there for Disney Star Wars uh, and you know it's just funny to look back that oh yeah like one of their first things coming in was cancelling this show um, because you know, from their perspective especially early on like they were very sort of anti-prequel and stuff like that so like there's a lot of reasons for like why from their perspective I suppose they, they cancelled it but um, it's very very funny in many ways to just see that like after all these years the excitement building up towards season seven and what they sort of could have had if they just continued with this when they took over like they really have no idea what they sort of missed out on if everything that they had planned was able to be made into episodes at the time but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see how season seven plays out when we get there it's just interesting to look at what's happening here given the that this for a time was sort of the ending of the show um, but anyway, let's get into it here. So we have a 20 episode season down two episodes from all of the previous seasons, which were 22 episodes. And interestingly, for the most part, this season is in order. The only episode that is out of order is the premiere revival, which should actually be the episode that takes place basically directly before Eminence. So basically, like it's just that when Maul is reintroduced in revival, it should be like directly before all of the other Maul episodes. I get in a way why they do it that way to kind of create a little bit of a, you know, a gap that like Maul uh, 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 and Savage are kind of like defeated and who knows when they'll be returned or, you know, saved. And so a bunch of other episodes happening in between makes sense to a degree, but chronologically all the other stuff does actually happen before this one. But anyway, let's, uh, I suppose for just for the sake of like keeping it all together, that means we will actually just view them um, in the actual chronological order this time. So the first arc here, even though it starts with episode two, is the Onderon arc. This is a, a war on two fronts, front runners, the soft war and tipping points. I think this is one of those arcs, I actually associate this in many ways very similarly to the Mon Cal arc from season four. Of it just being like a multi-episode arc that I really coming out of a feel like didn't need to be this many episodes long. I think there's a few reasons personally for that with myself. Even though while I love the, the fact that Ahsoka gets a big focus here. I like the sort of you know general them training them to sort of fend for themselves here. I like that Lux is involved. Um, I like that this is the introduction of Saw as well as Stila being a very good character. It's just too long i don't think this needed to be four episodes for what it was trying to accomplish um and then the other thing is just that in general i think there's only so much potential you have with an episode that is just focusing on basically rebellion setup this was i think one of the huge problems i had with just star wars rebels was like them expecting you to care about the minor details of the setting up of a rebel cell and it just taking so long when what you care about more is the character dynamic stuff rather than just you know here are the fighters we need to build the rebellion here's this to build rebellion and um, this one works you know to a degree but like i said it should have been maybe three episodes at the most didn't need to be four you know i i like 
the character stuff here of just, you know, Stila and Lux kind of getting into a relationship and Ahsoka kind of being on the outside, ha having previously sort of had the sort of, you know, blossoming dynamic with Lux, but, you know, I suppose it's her sort of encountering that whole, you know, Jedi thing of, like, it, it, it couldn't happen at this point. Um, but uh, anyway, you know, I, I think it's just an example of, like, a lot of the, the, the actual villains in this arc I don't think quite stand up that much. And while you get a very, very emotional kind of final moment with, like, the death of Stila and Ahsoka managing to rescue Lux, but, like, being kind of, you know, shot, basically, as, you know, she's trying to save Stila, it's just this very sort of tragic end, but, like, it, 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 it works. I, I, it's just not my favourite arc, I suppose is probably the best way to say it. Um, moving on to the next arc, it's another four episode arc, this is the sort of uh, Gathering or the Jedi Younglings arc, uh, and the episodes here are The Gathering, A Test of Strength, Bound for Rescue, and A Necessary Bond. Rewatching this fairly recently, I actually really like this arc, I always liked it at the time, um, but it really went up here on the rewatch for me. The first episode is great in that, you know, just Ahsoka and Yoda bringing them to Ilum. They're going to build their lightsabers, so they first have to get their crystals. And it was just so great meeting all these different characters. You know, we have a Wookiee Jedi youngling and all this sort of stuff. It, it, they're just a nice group of kind of unique characters. They're using, you know, species that we know. There's an Ithorian there and so on. And um, it really works and they just give them all sort of you know, basic but nice character arcs of just their sort of fear or flaw that they have to deal with before they can sort of get their crystal after they overcome it. Um, and it, I think it just works really well, you know, seeing Ilum finally, you know, after seeing some of this stuff in the original Clone Wars series, the Gennady Tartakovsky one, you're really going into it here. And then, of course, if you've played Jedi Fallen Order, we also get to see Ilum there as well. Um, so, very cool. In addition to just the idea of, like, Ahsoka is now sort of almost, like, senior enough within the Jedi Order that she is allowed to sort of, you know, be the sort of escort for younglings as they're going through their gathering. Um, that It's just nice to see that growth from her being that Padawan just being assigned to a master all the way up to this point where she is helping younglings on, on their path to get to that point. Um, going into like the seven, second episode of this arc, um, we get to, of course, see them actually build their lightsabers and we get the droid who, of course, helps them. Uh, really, really cool character there with him like referencing just how old he is and that like, I think he even says at one point he helped Yoda to create his lightsaber. So a lot of history with this character and just how he, they're all like, wait, why is a droid helping us to build our lightsaber? But he ends up really impressing them. And this is, of course, when the introduction of Hondo happens. And he's, of course, just trying to steal the crystals and sell them for money. And it's that typical dynamic with Hondo of, like, he can be the criminal, but he can also be very charismatic. And I like what they do with him over the course of this arc of, like, you see Ahsoka being the sort of guardian over the course of this arc, trying to help all the younglings. But um, she, of course, you know, gets sort of captured on her own in trying to save everyone. And so the younglings have to sort of team up together and, um, you know, have, make it all happen. They have to be the ones to rescue Ahsoka. And then, you know, Obi-Wan is trying to get there, but, you know, he's dealing with Grievous in the background. And then Grievous is on Florum and, you know, they're all just trying to get out because Grievous is here. I, am, I, I think there's some very fun arcs here. I love the, the kind of humor of them all kind of... Uh, basically dressing up as like a circus act, acrobats, and them super impressing everyone, and, and that's their sort of undercover kind of ploy. And then yeah, Hondo is definitely one of the best sort of recurring characters in the show, um, for sure. So uh, this was another episode that really proved that. Um, next up we have another four episode arc here in um, the sort of the droid, the Mieber Gascon arc, whatever way you want to call it. Uh, secret weapons, a sunny day in the void, missing in action, and point of no return. This is another arc where, why on earth was this one four episodes? 
I think a lot of people will cite this as probably being one of, if not the worst, arcs in the Clone Wars. In that, I think for sure it is the worst arc that has this many episodes. There's there's been like a few ones where it's like a solo episode that's not great, or maybe a two-parter that's not great. But here's a four-part arc that has very few, I think, really outstanding moments. I still think there's some potential in this, which is why I, I don't say like... This is just a complete arc that should be dropped. I get the idea of like having this kind of commander who thinks he's amazing, but they're actually just sort of using because of his size and teaming him up with some droids on this mission that's like important and they need a very specific squad for uh, and just making him feel super important and kind of it just going awry. And the dynamic of like him really not being into droids that much, but the droids ending up really impressing him with just how sort of unique and different they all are, and that they're not just, you know, they're programming basically. And it touches on a few ideas, even in like the weakest episode of the arc, like a sunny day in the void. But this should have been at most two episodes. I I think this would have actually been a fairly nice arc if it was only two episodes. I think the way that you should have done this arc is basically have um, the start of this arc and then the Gregor episode sort of linked together of like the mission starts and very quickly we land on the planet where Gregor is and so we need to recruit him to get off the planet and that's your first action-packed episode it's the introduction of Gregor Gregor's sacrifice and so on and then the second episode is pretty much the final episode of this arc with the whole Republic cruiser thing and the the, the military meeting and the the ship being a bomb and so on because that worked very well and, and it gave a chance for some of the droids to kind of be heroes and especially you know how big of a hero moment for R2 this is and basically like sacrificing himself to save everyone and him just barely being able to be repaired and ending that arc with the idea that like he is able to really see them as his team and while he's frustrated by them especially Whack he grows to trust them all over the course of that arc and um, so that's why I don't think it's just utterly forgettable and should have just been taken out but you didn't need four episodes like you absolutely did not need four episodes here and you've, you've been noticing that like that's kind of been the case for this entire season so far it's just them maybe just deciding oh we'll make this a four episode arc and this a four episode arc and this a four episode arc when some of these don't really need it. I don't think the Andoran arc needed four episodes. I think to a degree, maybe the the Gathering arc probably could have been again cut down to three. And again, like the, suddenly, all of a sudden, you freed up like four or five episodes that could have been, something else could have been done with. Uh, and that's just the way you have to look at this, given that some of the arcs had to be sort of cancelled because of when everything happened and so on. But you know, that's just you know what could have been in a way. So um, next up, this is where uh, Revival is actually meant to take place. So um, this is, I suppose, this is an interesting arc here. And that, like we go back to Mandalore. It's basically like Maul's like defeat and then return, teaming up with the Death Watch, taking over Mandalore and Obi-Wan coming back into things. Um, it's the end of the sort of Obi-Wan Maul rivalry for now. But obviously, Maul is still alive at the end of it all. So, it's Revival, The Lawless... Um, uh, sorry, it's Revival, Eminence, Shades of Reason, and The Lawless. That is the, the four-episode arc here. But it's a lot more sort of solo episodes, in a way. So, Revival does sort of stand out on its own. And I think is a very strong episode. Because it is, you know, Maul and Savage, you know, stealing all this money. And, um, you know... They kind of team up with Hondo and like they seemingly have those on guys on their side. Um, but this is when Obi-Wan and Adi Gallia come around to investigate. And you just get this really cool sequence where it's just two Jedi versus two Sith. And you get sort of Hondo eventually turning the tables and basically siding with Obi-Wan. Um, and so it's this really intense battle one of the best i think you know fights in the entire series because savage kills adigalia showing you know, how much he's grown he is able to kill a jedi master i think a, a council member i think adigalia is um, and so she's killed here leaving obi-wan to have to fight savage and maul on his own 
And it's this really intense kind of battle because they set up the dynamic so well. Maul hates Obi-Wan. Obi-Wan knows he has to deal with Maul here. And then Savage also doesn't like Obi-Wan. So he's in this incredibly bad situation that at the end of last season he had to have Ventress's help to get out of. So he has two lightsabers here. He does pick up Adigalia's lightsaber. So we see him uh, dual wielding here. And it works to his advantage as, you know, there's just this clever tactic over the course of the fight actually started off by Adigalia. That she tries to basically kick his leg out. So Adigalia kicks his, uh, I think it's his, like, right knee. And then Obi-Wan over the course of the fight continues to do that. But it seems like Savage is holding up completely well because he's so huge. And then in the, the big lockup at the end, after he does so well to defend against them both, he finally kicks it and, you know, he basically kind of blows Savage's knee out and uses that injury to his advantage to cut Savage's arm off. And uh, this is what really turns the tide and that they suddenly need to escape and they're completely under fire by Hondo and everyone and the tides are just completely turned against them and it seems like Maul is just completely miscalculated here his like uh his new kind of robot legs are kind of destroyed in some of this and so on and they're barely alive as they escape so it's, it's a really strong episode to just show like you know Obi-Wan had to have the desperate escape in the last encounter this time Maul and the press have to run away what will be the next thing Maul has even more reason for revenge now, which is where we go into um, Eminence, which is where, of course, they're found on their ship by the Death Watch, brought before Pre Vizsla, and immediately upon, like, healing him and, like, you know, giving him, like, proper, I suppose, robot legs, um, you can see Maul begin to take over. He still acts like, you know, okay, you're in charge, but I'll just give you some tactics, but you see him constantly overstep. And Pre Vizsla ultimately not really being able to sort of go against what Maul says because what he says is exactly what he wants. But you know Pre Vizsla wished that like he had been the one to say that. So it's this interesting conflict and, and what it of, of course builds to with their duel later on. It's just so strong. But, but I like the build up here in Eminence as you know they bring all the different sort of crime families on board. The Pikes and the Black Sun, the Huts and... Um, all to build up their power so that they can take over um, Mandalore. Um, which is where we go into Shades of Reason. And this is how they take over Mandalore. Which is basically by having all the criminals on their side. You know, cause chaos. And then realise that, oh, the government can't stop them. But the Death Watch can. And just creating this scenario where the Death Watch are turned into heroes. And they end up sort of capturing Maul and everyone and come across as heroes. The tie turns against Duchess Satine and so um, he takes, you know, command and so on. Um, but the entire time you're going through this is like, who's going to betray who first? And basically Vizsla uses this sort of fake capturing of everyone as more or less the way to properly capture everyone. But... Um, this is where we go into like the lawless and you know we get into the whole idea of their duel which is incredibly great the the whole dark saber coming back here this is where we see a change hands Vizsla uses it in the duel but of course he's killed by Maul and Maul takes over as the owner of the dark saber so uh, nice to follow that weapon given the Mandalorian connection now um, but yeah, this is where Obi-Wan comes into play here. He's going to Mandalore to check on what's going on. And interestingly, he, he, he's not going there on an official mission. So he has to kind of do an Anakin on it and basically use one of Anakin's ship to get there in order to save Satine. And the whole time you're sort of thinking like, oh, they're really getting across the idea that like he, he does care for her. And you really get into that idea of like back what he said of like, you know, if you had asked i would have left the jedi order so very very strong arc um and yeah like of course obi-wan ends up being able to help to a certain degree initially but then he ends up getting you know captured this is where um maul kills satine in front of obi-wan 
But the speech, I suppose, that they have, the back and forth model that Obi-Wan have is also, you know, pretty telling of just, it is Obi-Wan committing above all else that I am a Jedi, Jedi by default, you are stronger than the Sith because of their different approaches. And you can tell Maul is frustrated by the fact that he can't break Obi-Wan here. Um, but of course, this is where Bo-Katan comes in again. Bo-Katan left after Maul killed Vizsla. She refused to, uh, you know you know be underlings to him and this is this this episode is the setup for basically the siege of mandalore effectively in that as we kind of end this arc it's complete war chaos on mandalore satine's been killed you know bo katan is in in or around things and so on um and everything is just kind of going you know wrong all over the place this is where we get the reveal that bo katan is the sister of satine so that's a, a nice reveal to have in the back of your mind in all of this and then as obi-wan leaves uh, and escapes from uh, mandalore this is where we get uh, sidious coming into play so this was a huge moment you know sidious we've seen in or around the series do some stuff but here he properly jumps into action realizing that the threat that Maul is beginning to pose here, not just because of like, oh, he has this whole sort of underground empire, but because he's developing such a, into such of a threat, and he knows about the plan, the, the Revenge of the Sith plan, so this is where Sidious decides that he has to take them out. So amazing lightsaber battle between Sidious and uh, Savage and Maul. He kills Savage Press, um, pretty... Uh, I like the way they bring it back of like the second he's killed he sort of reverts to his normal form and and dies and so it's a pretty tragic moment for Maul here and then Sidious just completely dominates Maul and, and takes him capture uh, prisoner and just the idea that like okay Maul's gonna be prisoner for now and he has some Sidious has some sort of a plan in mind for Maul this is gonna be this unfortunate thing of that if you want to know how Maul goes from here to wh wherever he is in season 7 at the Siege of Mandalore, you have to pretty much read that comic. And, and this is where I wonder, like, have they done anything to these episodes since they were initially written to, you know, acknowledge the fact that this is season 7, ignoring the fact that some of the key plot stuff that happens in between happens in comics. Because not everyone's going to have read this comic, so there's got to be a big question mark about like how did Maul escape from Sidious or is he working for Sidious here so I, I am wondering will they explain Maul's side of that story or is that comic going to remain the go-to thing to explain all of that so that's that's an interesting thing to keep in mind um in terms of just plot and how it relates to the, the previous seasons and that like if there's a if there's an arc to watch before season seven it probably is like this arc as well as the the one we'll get into in a second here but um yeah hu huge moment there seeing Sidious in action uh the animation of uh, his style of lightsaber fighting i thought was so well done he, him using two blades against two opponents really really fit him just with how powerful he was then we get into the, what was for a time, the finale arc of Star Wars The Clone Wars. And the sort of uh, Ahsoka leaves the Order arc. Ahsoka is, you know, framed arc, whatever way you want to call it. We have Sabotage, the Jedi who knew too much to catch a Jedi and the wrong Jedi. So, um, this is definitely a very good arc. I, I don't think it's the best arc just because i think there are maybe a, a little bit of a kind of plot hole type thing in all of this and i think the plot hole kind of comes from the fact that in the first episode anakin and ahsoka are brought back to investigate this plot in the first place because they were absent at the time it happened so they're brought in as the investigators because they're completely innocent in all of this yet somehow ahsoka ends up basically getting framed for what exactly happened now we understand most of it most of what she is being you know suspected of is killing the the person later on but ultimately in the end she is still on trial for the bombing of the temple even though by default at the start she was sort of 
innocent of that. That's the only sort of like, you know, question marks like about this whole thing that I do end up having is just that that's always been something when I've watched this episode has never really quite connected for me. But part of this is meant to sort of be the corruption in all of this. That this is that this is sort of um, another thing that ultimately Palpatine, who is friends with Tarkin, is sort of engineering to happen. To have Anakin distrust the Jedi Order for not trusting Ahsoka. To sort of take Ahsoka out of things by, you know, having her question so much. That, that you're meant to view it as it being this whole big conspiracy uh, as much as, you know, the, it doesn't overly present it in that way. But that is the, the case. I, I love the emotion here of just, you know, Ahsoka knowing she hasn't done anything. And, and her, her arguing for herself. And, and Anakin just believing the whole time that she hasn't done anything. But knowing that, like, kind of understanding why she's running. But also knowing that, like, he has to try and get her back to... Uh, because he's going to do everything to try and exonerate her, to, to free her from, from what's going on here. And it's just a cool sequence of, like, you get to see Ahsoka running away from the clones, them all using the, the stun blasters, because, of course, no one's trying to kill anyone here. And then she's forced to actually, you know, team up with Asajj Ventress, which is a really cool dynamic. Like, we've only seen them interact a couple of times, but here they are actually teaming up. Um, and... You know, it's, it's actually a nice dynamic here as it, of course, builds into the idea of, like, setting up, ultimately, Barris as being the one behind all of this. And as we go into the last episode and, like, Ahsoka ends up getting captured and is put on trial and you see the Jedi Council expel her from the Order with the idea that, like, I think all except a handful of them uh, agreed to it. I think with the idea that, like, you know, Obi-Wan and probably Plo Koon were two of the few that said no to it. Um, you know, P Padme is arguing on her behalf, of course. And then Anakin and his just relentless drive to try and, you know, you know, fix everything. And he finds Ventress, you know, just, you know, takes her out super easily and, like, gets to the, the truth of the information here that it's Barris. And I love that fight between Anakin and Barris. It's such a, a great battle because, of course, it's it's Barris sort of trying to act like a dark side user while not actually being a dark side user. And you know, she ends up sort of frustrating Anakin throughout the battle by just sort of staying in there. But like the second he has the the, the space and time to really go at her, he just you know really kind of bursts through and just uh, takes her out. So. Very, very cool final battle that just shows the, the strength of Anakin as we get closer and closer to Revenge of the Sith. And it's such a cool moment as he just, you know, interrupts the trial, you know, and just confirms to everyone, this is who's actually behind it. Ahsoka is uh, innocent and how, oh, finally, it's, it's all coming to an end. But they turn it around and it's like Ahsoka is allowed back into the Jedi Order, but chooses not to accept it chooses to leave and try and figure things out on her own outside of the Jedi Order and you get that incredibly emotional scene between Ahsoka and Anakin as he basically like begs her to to stay there and you know he's getting across you know the idea of like that you know she means so much to him but she's like no I have to do this for myself it's not just about you and he he gets very real with her for a second here, and he's just like, "Look, I, I know how it feels, you know. Like I've considered, you know, leaving the Jedi Order as well." And she turns around and is like, "I know." And there's been so much speculation about, like, what does that mean? Like, what does she mean when she says, "I know"? And I think it's clear enough that Ahsoka, pretty much at this point, five seasons in, most people figure that she has to know she, uh, he and Padme are in a relationship. There's just no way she's interacted with the two of them individually for enough time and as well as been around when they've been together that she couldn't know that they're a couple or there's something going on or that at the very least Anakin had considered leaving to be with her or something like that. She may not know the full story but that she understands what would kind of cause him to leave um, and she just has to figure things out on her own. And it's a very, you know... 
impressive ending in that sense and that they for so long like this was just this was it like we we had like basically a whole year of this being the end of the show of just ahsoka is not part of the jedi order and it's like we're so close to revenge of the sith like what what happens with ahsoka does she survive or like we had so many questions because of course rebels didn't happen until a few years later and stuff like that so it was really you know cool to see all of that happen and as well as that you know it, it's her betrayal like uh, being betrayed by barris the fact that the jedi council ultimately didn't have that sort of faith and trust in her and it was kind of only anakin in many ways that really really stood up for her um and it's it's very powerful it's just like it is that unfortunate thing of like even counting season six we didn't ever get that arc of like what she was doing outside which is where season seven is going to come into play in that we know at least one of the arcs or at least set up for one of the arcs is going to be just ahsoka on her own outside of the jedi order just being a citizen i suppose and figuring things out and and that's going to be interesting to see what she does and how she is eventually brought back into things for the siege of mandalore and then how much like implication of how much time has passed happens and so on that's where like season seven is really going to have its strengths um but yeah i i do very much like the arc outside of just a little bit of sort of like the writing isn't as like good as maybe you'd expect it to be given that it is a final arc it just feels like they should have been able to fill out some of those kind of plot holes a little bit better than they did but it doesn't get too too much in the way of the arc for me um but uh yeah that's uh, season five of the clone wars the last sort of big season we've had you know with more than like 13 episodes and then we're getting i think it's 12 for season seven um so it's going to be pretty interesting so yeah um yeah we'll, we'll cover season six in the next video and of course i'll also have a sort of preview video ahead of uh, season seven like i said before i will be reviewing each episode of season seven as it airs i think we, i think at this point we now have official confirmation that the episodes are going to air weekly like the mandalorian we're not just getting the entire season at once it's a, it's airing one a week so that's uh, I think that's ultimately a good move to build excitement uh, in that like we're we're going to get in there I think with the bad batch arc initially uh, so it's going to take you know three four episodes before we finally get into Ahsoka in season seven and that is going to be pretty exciting when we finally get there so um yeah there are my thoughts on the Clone Wars season five in the comments let me know what your thoughts were but that has been the video thanks for watching and bye